There I am. Good morning again. It's great to hear the sound of your own voice. If you're joining us online, thanks for doing that. Uh, recently, I read um, a statement from Open Doors. It's a non-governmental organization that focuses on Christians who are at high risk of high levels of persecution. They estimated that number at 260 million in our world right now, and that number continues to grow. The question I have then, if, if that is going on, Why? Why continue to remain faithful? What is our hope in the face of persecution? That's what I want to talk about today. So if you've got a Bible, if you'd open it to Revelation chapters 6 and 7, we're going to go through these chapters asking this question, what's our hope in the face of persecution? Now as you turn there, let me get you up to speed, what's been going on. We looked in Revelation 1. John has been exiled or banished to the island of Patmos, and God gives him a vision. But this vision is not to speculate, to put a timeline together, but as we found out in chapter 1, verse 3, it is a prophetic word for seven churches that are facing intense persecution. The civic religion of Rome is you worship the emperor as God. The people believe the blessings of the gods are mediated to the emperor, and you worship him. And, And to not worship him is to risk The God's favor, it's viewed as unpatriotic, it's viewed as being seditious. And it was so important that in seven, or six of these seven cities, the government built temples for people to come and worship. In five of these cities, there was a government-funded priesthood to lead the people in worshiping the emperor. So you guys give the support to the pastor to hopefully direct you to worship God. No, no, no. This was set up so the people could worship the emperor. And to not do this, participate in this civic religion, could cost you your job, it cost you family, it cost your life. Additionally, there were trade guilds. So if you were a woodworker, there was a God that you were accountable to, that he had given you your work, and every month they'd have a feast, and, and, and they'd eat food sacrificed to that God, and if you weren't there, it's where were you? How come I'm not seeing you? So John, having received this vision, which is a prophetic word, writes a letter. He's a pastor to these people. Though he is exiled to the island of Patmos, there's a series of seven churches, starting with Ephesus. That's the closest one. What they think is they got the letter, they copied it, and they sent it on to the second one. He is pastoring these people through the letter. So chapter 1 is then a vision of God. This vision is what will sustain you in the persecution. Then chapters 2 and 3, God has a specific word for each of the seven churches, and that's what we looked at. Chapters 4 and 5, then John is caught up again in the vision, and he's in heaven, and he sees heaven is ordered. People are worshiping God as they should, but what's going on on earth is not close to what's going on in heaven. So there's a scroll that has God's plan, both of judgment and salvation, to bring heaven's order to earth. But it's got seven seals. In the Roman day, that seal meant you couldn't open that unless you had position in the government authority. So every, Joe Citizen couldn't open that. And God is using, again, that picture of who has authority to open this. And, and John begins to weep because no one is worthy. And we will sing a closing song about worthy is the one. Well, this is where this comes from. No one is worthy until he sees Jesus. And what he hears about Jesus is the Lion of Judah, the Root of David. Those are militaristic terms suggesting conquering. But then he turns and he sees a slain lamb. This one will conquer or has conquered by dying for his enemies. And that's the picture that is given to that church. And so today, the seals are going to begin to be opened. And God's plan of salvation and judgment, which will bring redemption to the earth, will be unveiled. And here's where we start in chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living voices, creatures saying as with a voice of thunder, Come, I looked, and behold, a white horse who sat on it and had a bow. A bow is an instrument of war. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. This is a picture of the Roman Empire. They were expanding. They were a a, a major military force, and they keep growing. And men, they are proud of who they are. No one can stop them. But God will have the final word on that, and we'll see that with the second seal. 
When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come. And another, a red horse, symbolic of bloodshed, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth. Now, the Romans were very, very proud of their peace. Pax Romana, I think it's Latin. They were proud of that. They had brought peace. And God's saying, that ain't going to last. In fact, your citizens are going to turn on one another. Second part of verse 4, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. Third seal, broken, verses 5 and 6. When he broke the third seal, I heard the living creature saying, come. I looked, behold, a black horse, symbolic of pestilence and famine. And he he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, symbolic of economic injustice and disparity. Verse 6, I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for denarius. A denarius was a day's wage. The basic, basic staples of life have gotten out of reach for the worker. And three quarts of barley for a denarius. Why? Last part of verse 6, and do not do damage, do not damage the oil and the wine. These luxury goods, oil and wine, Roman was, Rome was enamored with them. And they were investing their resources there to the point they weren't planting crops. And the worker was starving because he and she and their families couldn't afford it. Fourth seal. Then the lamb broke the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the living creature saying, Come. I looked and behold an ashen horse or a white horse. How many Clint Eastwood fans do we have? Do you remember Pale Rider? Thank you. Thank you. I see that back there. Pale Rider. This is where it comes from. Randy, I knew you'd want to know that. Okay. And he sat on it, had the name Death. And Hayes was following him. Authority was given him over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. A quarter of the earth. Look, if God just wanted to wipe the earth out, he takes the whole thing. But it's a quarter of the earth. And, and these... John sees them in sequence, but they're happening at various times and places. And, 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 and it's a call to the earth. Wake up. To Rome, wake up. You're not in control. I can bring judgment on your kingdom as I choose. Now, we're talking about seven churches. Remember, they're getting the word. They're the ones that are going through it. Imagine you're one of the seven churches. You're in Ephesus, you're in Laodicea, you're in Smyrna, you're in Philadelphia, wherever you are. What's your reaction when you hear this? That God's going to bring judgment. Another question, for those who have turned from God, court of the earth, are they turning back? Are they repenting? Is it making them stop to think again? Now, please hear me. I'm not suggesting what has happened in the last 15 years is necessarily the direct hand of judgment of God, but I think it is a consequence of the world turning from God. My parents grew up in the Great Depression, and uh, they described that, and what I understood was that banking systems were put in place, and then we had an economy. I remember in the late 1990s into the century, they they said we might have the recession-proof economy. Then in 2008... We come this close as a nation to having a depression. Two years ago, you realize it was two, go, two years ago this Sunday. It's the first time we didn't meet because of the pandemic. I remember hearing about that and I thought, you know, we, we don't do pandemics in the States. We had SIRS and we had Mer, Mar, MERS and, and we, we just don't, we don't. But well, we just did a pandemic. And then we thought after World War II, we had, we had a global economy, and, and at least in Europe, we had, we had stopped these madmen. And, and then three weeks ago, or whatever it was, I've watched with horror, and you have too, as a madman has invaded Ukraine. Where does that go? Does that make you stop and think, we're not in control? Lord Jesus, we just ask him. Because I think God is speaking through the circumstances, and he's directly speaking to these People, look, you want to know the consequence of rebellion against God? It's warfare. It's famine. It's pestilence. It's death. Again, we are trying to take principles from these, this word to these churches. And so, God is directly judging the Roman Empire. 
in the hopes that people would turn. Well, the fifth seal is a shift. Remember, John's in a vision. There's a shift from what's going on to earth until heaven. Here's what it says, verse 9. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. So they were told, look, you, you are upsetting the gods of Rome. You need to back off this Jesus thing. I can't do that. That'll be your life. Uh, they're under the altar. They have been, their lives have been poured out for God is what has happened. These people have paid the ultimate price, and they're asking a question. Verse 10, they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long? See, in a human court, they were found guilty. Guilty of what? Maybe sedition. You're undermining the Roman authority by trusting this one who says he's coming back to bring his kingdom blasphemy. You are worshiping a false god, and you're upsetting the gods of Rome. If you will not recant, you're guilty. They say, we've been found guilty in a human court, but what about a heavenly court? Verse 11. And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. They were told hang on, there's more who have to give their life. And oh, by the way, that number continues to grow today. People are giving their life for the cause of Christ all the time in our world. Revelation is not a book about getting out. It is about a book about the sufficiency of God in the midst of persecution. My question is, how do we get to the point where our view ultimately our life is God's and to be poured out for his purposes? You guys, I got stuff I want to do. I got stuff I want in this world. Do I understand there's something more? And that's living full on and full out for God. That leads to the sixth seal that's broken. It says, I looked, and when he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it had been rolled up, and every mountain island were moved out of their places. Remember, we're using apocalyptic language. We're using symbols to communicate a message. And this is radical description to say the world is going to be a sudden, at the end there's going to be a sudden upheaval. Remember we talked about a, a political commentator, sometimes we'll use a, a political cartoon because the images stick. God is giving images here to say there is a dramatic and sudden upheaval coming in our world. And what will the result be? Verse 15, then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. So every socioeconomic class, the king to the slave, everybody has headed for the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide from the presence of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of God. They're trying to hide from the wrath of God, but there's no place to hide. So when I was in high school, I was a jock. And I was a lettered as a sophomore in swimming, and I was a part of the Letterman's Club as a junior. And we had a fundraiser, football games. We would sell popcorn. And the football stadium was across the street. And the popcorn room was at the other, other end of the school. So we're doing our popcorn and selling. And, and one of the guys that I swam with, he was the president of the Letterman's Club, he looked like he could be about 24, and he, want, and he bought a six-pack of beer. So we bring, he brings a six-pack of beer into that. I think there's six of us, five of us there. We pop a cold one. And we are feeling good because we are thumbing our nose at authority, and we are getting away with it. And you guys, it's all good until one of the guys comes out, and he looks around the corner, and he goes, you guys, Swinford. Mr. Swinford was our sponsor, and he was coming back to check on us. 
And all of a sudden, this arrogance and this love in our nose is like, oh boy, we got problems. And in fact, we got caught. And yours truly got suspended from high school. But I'll never forget that moment like we thought we're pulling. Well, that's just a picture of what's going on here. The world thumbs their nose at God, but at some point, God, remember, he starts with a quarter of the earth. The hope is people will rep- repent. But the sixth seal looks to the end times when God said, enough. My judgment is final, and it will happen. And there's a question that comes out of that in verse 17. It says this, for the great day of their wrath is come, and who's able to stand? Who is able to stand against this great judgment of God? So there's an interlude in the breaking of the seals in chapter 7 to answer that question. And it starts this way. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. This is parallel with the four horsemen. So that no wind could blow on the earth or on blow on the sea or any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, and cried out with a loud voice to the four angels whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not. Harm the earth or the sea or the trees until what? Until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. This is from Ezekiel 9. When God said he's going to judge the city. But he marks his people with an X on their forehead. That they won't suffer the judgment of God. And I believe the people of God will suffer the persecution of God right up until he comes. But I believe he spares them from the judgment of God. Which we are seeing poured out and we will see poured out more as we go through the book of Revelation. And then John says in verse 4, uh, verse four, I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 sealed from every tribe. And he goes on to describe the 12 tribes of Israel, each having 12,000. Now we've talked about numbers being symbolic. 12 is a number of completion. So we've got 12 times 12 times 1,000, another number of completion. This is a, to show, this is the complete people of God. And the fact that they're telling taking a military a census is symbolic of going to war. God's army is being talked about here. The tribes of Israel are listed. Judah is listed before Reuben because that's where Jesus comes from. Dan is not listed because of its idolatry. But this is, again, a militaristic picture. This is what John hears. Remember in chapter 5, he heard the root of David. He heard the line of Judah, and then he turned to see the slain lamb. So he hears in terms of militaristic terms, but this is what he sees, verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation, all tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, symbol of victory, and palm branches were in their hands. Not just Israel, every tribe, every nation. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing, glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in white, again, symbolic of victory and purity, who are they? Where do they come from? John says, My Lord, you know, because I don't. And he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. Understand, they didn't get pulled out. They came through it. There's a certain theology that says God pulls his people before the great tribulation. I disagree. This would say they've come through it. Some have been martyred. Some have suffered in other ways. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple, and he sits on the throne, will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, meaning at one point they hungered, nor thirst anymore. At one point, they dealt with thirst. Nor will the sun be down on them, nor any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. That looks forward to the ultimate salvation. Talked about in Revelation 21, where God says, I will take away every pain, every suffering, no more death, no more sickness. Remember, he's speaking to a people who have seen their friends martyred, who are facing it. And he's saying, God has a final redemptive act. God is in the process of redeeming this, but we need to wait. 
So you guys, if you've heard me speak before, you know I'm a big college football fan. Um, but there's a play in football. It's a screen pass. The quarterback, quarterback takes the snap and he drops back. And the defensive linemen come in on the quarterback. And I'm watching Michigan play and they're playing, I don't know, they're playing Ohio State. And I see these linemen come in and I think, oh no, this play is going badly. But that's by design. Because the offensive linemen, they drift out to a side, a running back drops back. The quarterback baits the lineman, and he drops the ball. And that back's got the ball, and he's got three linemen in front of him. If it's executed, it's a thing of beauty. But there's a second, if it's your team executing the screen, you think, oh, no, until you see the final outcome. Guys, we're in the oh, no stage of persecution. We're in the oh, no stage of martyrdom. There's a final redemptive act of God, but we're waiting on that. Do we have the faith to trust God? Imagine you're in one of those seven churches and you're seeing it happen. And there are people around the world who are seeing this happen. Do you believe God will be faithful? Are we willing to wait for God's final redemption? See, we're asking this question. What's our hope in the face of persecution? Here it is. God's going to reward and vindicate those who suffer for him. God is going to reward and vindicate those who suffer for him. What chapters 4 and 5, and now 6 and 7 are telling us, is that God is going to bring his king to earth through the suffering church, through the pain and loss of his people. And in the end, he will vindicate and reward those people. So maybe you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus and you think, that is nutty, 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 Andy. I wouldn't give up anything for that. Why, why would I do that? Let me see if I can explain it this way. Anytime I use an illustration with a family member, of course, I clear it with them. So our younger son, Drew, is uh, running sound today, and this t- deals with him. So when he was a little boy, and I got his okay on this, he loved fireworks, and we would give him an allowance. And around every 4th of July, he would pull up, and, and he would want to buy fireworks. And we would say, son, are you sure you want to do this? Because all your money's going to go, it's going to go, you know, it's going to be 30 seconds, it's going to be, yeah, and year after year he did it. But I remember he was 9 or 10, and we pulled in, we were living in South Lincoln, uh, 84th and Old Cheney, Lincoln Christian had a fireworks stand, and we pull up, and he said, Dad, I don't want to, I don't want to do it. Because we said, you know, you really like Legos, you could put that money towards Legos, and, and you would have those Legos longer than 30 seconds. And we had lunch this week, and he said, you know, Dad, I, I still got those Legos, yeah, and maybe, you, son, you might be able to play with those Legos with your kid someday. When you, there's a lasting value. You, you put that money into fireworks, it's, it's fine, but it's gone. I'm telling you, the world is like fireworks. It satisfies for a minute, but it's gone. This is a call to an eternal perspective. Yes, I will suffer. Yes, because I believe God. I believe there's something more than this world. And yes, it may even cost me as much as my life, but I think Jesus is worth it. That's why, for those who are not following Jesus, why would people consider this? Because we think there's something greater. Now, many of you in here I know are followers of Jesus, and you've been that way for a while. That's great. But this passage is asking us, how seriously do we believe in the Word of God? Do we believe Jesus is trustworthy? Do we believe what he's talking about in Revelation is really going to happen? Because our faith, our testimony of Jesus may cost us. Is Jesus true to his word? Can you and I trust that? Because, my friends, that may be all we have when people begin to push us to compromise our testimony about Jesus. Is is he true to this? Is he good to that? Are are we building our trust now that at moment we will hang on to him? Um, Both my parents grew up in a small town in Maine, and as such, all my aunts and uncles lived up there. We moved around a lot as a kid, but when I was a, a sophomore in college, my parents moved back up to New Jersey, which means at the end of my summer's they would let me use a car and I would drive up to Maine. And I had a, 
an aunt and an uncle. I had several sets of family. But this one would take me to Bar Harbor, Bar Harbor which is right down on the coast, and take, take us out to dinner. And they would say, you can get anything you want on the menu. Now, the seafood there is not the stuff you fly in from Maine to Omaha and get struck down in Nebraska. This is fresh seafood. And they say, you know, there's lobster, there's crab. Do you want to try any of that? Oh, no. No, no. Because I like steak. And I'm just not going to... Some of you guys, what are you thinking? Well, I wasn't. But I, I mean, steak had a hold on me. So I did that. I had two Augusts in a row. I'd go up and visit him. What do you want? And I had a steak. Well, that next Christmas, we were all together as a family. So everybody went up there. We're at that same restaurant, and I'm sitting next to my mom. And my mom says, Andrew, will you please just try a bite of lobster? Dip it in the thing. Have it. And I, with that one bite, I thought, oh, I've made a mistake. My, the steak, the whole steak had on me kept me from experiencing something much richer, much tastier. This is pushing us. The comfort, the acclaim, the pleasure of the world, does it have a hold on us to the point that we're missing out on something much richer, something much tastier, something of much more value, that being Jesus. What's our hope in the face of persecution? Here it is. God will reward and vindicate those who suffer for him. God will reward and vindicate those who suffer for him. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, we're challenged by this word from the book of Revelation. Um, seven churches were going through it because there was a, an emperor, a culture that demanded full allegiance. And to not would be to lose Lord, we live in a world to varying degrees that is challenging our allegiance. Lord, would we take hold of, of you and your word and put our trust in that? Would we understand that what this world has to offer is, is like those fireworks. They go up and they're gone. And what we've given ourselves to doesn't last. Lord, we give ourselves to that which is eternal. I pray in Christ's name.